welcome to a talk on the relational field and the remarkable and evolving world of biodynamic chronicle therapy and really a very exciting development in touch skills and uh, perception and healing uh, so I'll be talking for about 40-45 minutes and looking at a whole number of slides trying to um, open up to some of the powerful aspects of this work. I'm Jed Sumner. I've been fortunate to be involved in the development of this work over the last 20 years uh, since I first came in contact with it in London in the early 90s and I've been uh, practicing and teaching this work ever since. And I'm the director of uh, Body Intelligence Trainings, which is offering trainings pretty much in most places in the world at the moment. So really great to see the uh, movement that's occurring around uh, this powerful form of healing. Here's a picture that we often use in the course to show some aspect of what happens when you touch somebody with um, really no agenda, uh, a touch that's interested in health and allowing the body to reorganize itself from within. And uh, we've looked at a number of explanations for what goes on when you do this, and this kind of shows a little bit of that, but I think it's much more complex and Here's what I think might be what's going on partly. So just all kinds of flows of connectivity that develop through touch that you can't really see, but uh, it starts to generate a internal response in the client system. And uh, just all kinds of schemes of uh, healing movements uh, that seem to just naturally occur and this is quite useful I kind of like this idea of a of an inherent kind of morphic shift that is just very much part of our nature since we were cells and now a collection of cells so this shows to me our ability to readily reorganize our form uh, in a very fluid kind of expression. So that's kind of part of it. And this too, I notice, is what goes on in treatments. Um, you know, the whole movement of heart and blood and this probably, you know, utterly remarkable relationship between two circulatory systems and how uh, the heart can speed up and slow down in a session and then how blood can pulse and reorganize itself and all the major vessels can do that and then everything around the vessels sort of follows suit. So that's something that I think might be going on in the relational field. Certainly this, I mean big time this, um, I'm noticing more and more shifts in the central nervous system and people coming out of hyperarousals, PTSD states and literally feels like neurons and glial cells are reformatting themselves in some way and healing and uh, people's central nervous systems just seem to do the most remarkable things and people come out of or at least mitigate around strong pathologies. This too is such a big feature of our bodies. That, I mean, we are one massive fascial matrix and the work for sure recognizes shapes and patterns and uh, shifts and changes within the fascial balance of the body. And often that's quite demonstrative. You can kind of really, I must see the body uh, rebalancing and uh, finding a new shape 
in its fascial integrity. This is something too that gets really recognized. So this, you know, we're not just bodies, we are bodies in relationship to other things, other bodies on the planet and the planet itself. So this idea of a kind of connection with nature and a kind of reformatting or integrating of our physiologies to the big picture of life that goes on too. And then this is quite a cool animation of electric fields and I think this goes on, this kind of, you know, just uh, two fields coming together and meshing in some way. So these kind of invisible forces that go on when you touch people between two bodies. And uh, there's a big interest in embryology in the therapy and in the teaching of it, which um, really kind of shows what we fundamentally are. So this is a, a fluid, membranous being, isn't it? I mean, it's a, a soft body, and I think this is something that starts to emerge quite readily in treatments, where the body just starts to melt and shows this um, expanded, fluid, membranous state uh, that seems to be a very good form for reorganizing and uh, making adjustments to towards a, a more balanced uh, structure. And the fluid body, which is a beautiful concept within the work, and I think one fluid body touching another promotes this deepening into what we really are. I mean, this is a cells, which are fluid droplets, really, surrounded by more fluids. So it's kind of uh, a big expression in treatments where the body drops into a fluid state and starts to morph from that fluid body. Here's some attributes of the relational field. So this is a list of what makes the relational field more powerful. So certainly an embodied presence from the practitioner. So the practitioner needs to be still and aware, but n but in a soft way, just kind of open to what's arising in the client system. And that's a nice phrase, state of balanced awareness. So also not being well, being mindful of the practitioner's own body, and uh, as well as the client. So, just noticing how you are in the session and having this kind of divided awareness between the two. So that seems to make a big difference. Being holistic. So being with the whole of you and the whole of the client, even though the client might not be able to show you that but that seems to generate an opportunity for things to come into relationship with the whole. Yes, it's a light touch. I mean, it's not a, it's not a touch that's off the body. It's definitely an engaged contact, but it's not bringing pressure or focus or bringing action through the hands. The hands are I guess in a kind of sensate mode, uh, a kind of receiving of how things are. And neutral listening is a phrase that uh, gets used quite a lot to describe, I guess, the practitioner's ability to be objective and not get too involved, but be involved at the same time. So kind of very empathetic, but also slightly detached from what's uh, shifting and changing in the body, waiting for things to arise. Uh, that's the order of the day, I think, in the work. So this idea of a inherent treatment plan, so that you're not carrying the agenda or the 
set of priorities for the client's body. The body is choosing that innately from within itself and you're giving that a, a space to come through. Being still, being aware of stillness, uh, even though it might not be very obvious in the client initially, but it's considered a kind of background expression that generally comes through to the foreground in most uh, treatments. This is quite a big part of the work, so it can't be any set of hands. It needs to be informed hands. And those hands need to recognize structure, different layers of the physiology, subtle movements within the physiology, movements of fluids, uh, even subtler movements, so that uh, after practice and refining your touch skills, you can touch a body and start to listen with depth and that um, and then a body will respond to knowing hands in the most remarkable way it's like a, a very deep listening there's more uh, so it's important that the practitioner is aligned and balanced posturally um, there's a I suppose a non-action which is quite a deep uh, learning process to go through so really mostly at an unconscious level letting go of a need to change things or make things happen or bring about specific shifts and adjustments it really is sitting and letting things move from and within themselves and an orientation not just to the body structure but also to its internal fluid dynamics and this notion of potency, a sort of vitality within the fluids and in the tissues. That plays a big part in how we listen. Acknowledgement of health. So being in your own health as a practitioner, can I say we're mostly health, I mean easily. And doing the same with the client system, even though the client might be coming with various conditions and pathologies, uh, just to touch a body and go, yes, I recognize all that, but also let's listen into the underlying health. That changes things enormously and, and, and is a important part of relational fields. You being equanimous, so it is really, you know, quite still and um, untroubled, not getting involved in things, just being there as a witness uh, and being detached to how things evolve during the session, whatever takes place. So I think that's quite a powerful letting go of the space and the containment of the space and being able to verbally communicate while you're in touch with the client. So there's a whole uh, process of useful verbal communications and suggestions during the session, which can be extremely useful to the client and the therapeutic process. Here's a picture, Steve Haynes actually treating somebody in his practice room and that's a very typical sort of image I mean the therapy doesn't look like much at all really it's just a very static contact from the outside anyway but from the inside it's extremely lively lots of uh, movements within the physiology of the body as uh, things shift and change and typically you might be in contact with one part of the body for 10, 15, even 20 minutes and um, just staying with one handhold or maybe two or three during the whole session. It's a great way to work with 
bodies in a very gentle way so its application is you know really powerful it can work with some very fragile conditions such as I guess um, neurological issues or something cerebrovascular has occurred or you know with infants and newborns and uh, it's very well known in some parts of the world for helping uh, mothers prepare for birth and the mother and baby recover from a birth process whatever experience they had it seems to work extremely well for that and also great for difficult emotions and you can treat animals some practitioners do and this shared emotional states that run between animals and humans I, I think it's a fantastic tool for letting people resolve and discharge around emotional holding in the body and kind of limbic system emotional um, you know shifts can occur very commonly in most sessions great to bring your energy up and people coming out of low energy states to higher energy states are very typical I suppose chronic fatigue would be a very good example of uh, somebody struggling enormously around this kind of thing and this just seems to work really well uh, with most cases of chronic fatigue I've treated for sure and, 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 and slowly people start to come out of that state and have a life again really so all of that and I think more recently the therapy has just become very well known as a trauma resolution therapy and it didn't begin its life like that but for sure it's become uh, all about unwrapping various trauma affects in the body and um, consequently uh, in the biodynamic current psychotherapy courses there's, there's, there's a lot of discussion about trauma and uh, all kinds of trauma models are used so that uh, students can understand the kind of things that might be happening in a session where somebody releases uh, the trauma, some experience that might have occurred decades ago or, 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 or might have occurred more recently but has somehow got trapped in various parts of the body. This is a picture showing the amygdalas and the limbic system which typically can hold a lot of that. Yeah, about health really, that's what it is. It's really nice to observe what occurs with clients when the kind of light comes back into their eyes and there's a glow starts to come through and just you know naturally really without being told they just start to behave differently uh, the bodies are just you know much more smoothly balanced and uh, they start to move out of all kinds of mental and emotional states into the inheritance of health pain goes on for people of course and I think this is a great you know enabler around coming out of pain and discomfort and really appreciates the whole chemistry of pain that sort of runs from the brain to the injured part of the body and to various segments of the body that's uh, definitely understood and you know people can quite quickly come through terrible pain and to much more ease and uh, they get the life back around uh, all of that so the body is a fluid body and that's something that's really appreciated in the work the body is a collection of tissues and structures most of this is showing connective tissues but it's any structure in the body is this really value for what it is and your ability to listen into these different tissues is uh, a powerful part of the therapy and life you know life and vitality and this this idea of a 
a potency which uh, we would say is underlying everything and uh, we might talk about the amount of potency that a client system has or perhaps during a session there's a change in the potency or there's a release of potency uh, and then the physiology starts to move so much better. And I think biodynamic work really recognizes just how powerful we really are and uh, that when you're touching a body you're touching something that's been formed out of massive energies and is a powerful part of the universe so people can make the most remarkable shifts uh, just because of that. Listening to the physiology in a holistic way I think this is just one big key part of the touch uh, jigsaw puzzle and um, yeah here's a picture from way back and looking at um, the anatomy of the body so there's a deep connection with understanding anatomy not not just in terms of names of things and a kind of dry knowledge of things but more in terms of a living anatomy uh, so you know, if you touch somebody's head, what's the biggest thing under your hands? I mean, clearly it's the brain, isn't it? So perhaps you've got your hands at the top of their head or the back of their head, and there's these layers of, I guess, connective tissue, bone, a bit of muscle, but underneath is this kind of fluid neural expression. So getting to know um, deep movements and tones and textures that don't lie necessarily right next to your hands that's part of the work and uh, to get so good at it that you can really appreciate how the cerebellum is in terms of its shape and its physiology it's kind of unique part of the brain how it is in terms of subtle rhythmic expressions and also how to listen in and know its health or the health of the brainstem you know so so you can touch a body and go oh, you, the body feels aroused or charged up or a body feels relaxed or a body feels held or tight or low in energy all those things and then various parts of the body uh, showed unique expressions around that so differentiation of tissue so that you can touch and go yeah those are cerebral hemispheres those the brainstem or the pituitary and you can be kind of open to a connection with what lies beneath and really your hands don't need to necessarily be at the back of somebody's head they could be at the other end of the body depends how uh, available somebody's body is to touch and perception. Here's an image that uh, is kind of really useful around touch. You know, this is showing the cranium with the trapezius muscles, I think, and then the neck and vertebral bodies and the cord and so on. And I think it's this kind of image that we find really useful to explain what we might be feeling so you might have hands on somebody's neck and you're just listening and waiting for the body to respond and then you're noticing some some kind of pulsing or an electrical movement or an electrical discharge perhaps or a pulling off to one side or maybe you're noticing vertebrae shifting from side to side or rotating derotating so I think these anatomy images just help you figure what is coming to you, what the body's story is. And, well, here's a remarkable part of the body, the vertebral column, which is a miracle, really, of uh, function and form. And perhaps I can just use this as an example of holistic touch so maybe this is somebody's uh, vertebral column that's coming to see you 
and you know maybe there's some kind of bulging disc around the lower lumbar so I don't know L4 or L5 and the clients in quite a bit of pain so and use the practitioner get them on table perhaps and then you're able to touch him with one hand sort of cupping the sacrum one hand across the lumbar arch that's a very typical hold for this part of the body and then you perhaps listen in you you generate all those relational field attributes and listen in to what's going on in the sacrum and the lumbar sacral area so those tissues and the body responds in some kind of way or you do exactly the same thing but you're listening into the lumbar sacral area in relationship to the whole vertebral column right up into the thoracics and the neck and the cranial base and the body responds more powerfully uh, simply because you've opened up a bigger relational field you've involved more relationships you've involved not just the local tissues but those tissues in, in connection with the whole column which is a unit in itself and or you're touching in doing all that but at the same time you're you're saying oh the vertebral column is at the center of a whole body physiology so you're listening to it now in an even bigger relational field and the body responds even more powerfully because I think uh, bodies like holistic touch and a touch that is inclusive and recognizing the interplay between many many diff different tissue fields and I think to truly resolve something in the lumbar 4 or lumbar 5 disc not just the local tissues need to shift and change but also the whole column and, 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 and then all kinds of tissues around the column depending on how long that's been running in the body Dr. Sutherland, the founder of the therapy, got very interested in these remarkable membranes. So uh, they're called the dura mater. So this is a view of the interior of the head, and this is how the brain gets supported. It's the brain's very soft, so part of how it uh, survives in this hard, bony cranium is to have a fluid dynamic going off for it but also a very powerful membranous uh, support so the, the, this is the well, it, these are all collagen based materials and um, it's like one big C curve called the falx and then there's a couple of horizontal structures they've got slight cutaways in this picture but just imagine those as two wings and then all the lining of the cranium is also continuous with those structures so there's in a way a, a sort of balloon with these remarkable wings and a big sort of C curve that projects deep inside the cranium and you see from this picture there it is surrounding the cranium but it also carries on down and surrounds the cord and basically it's kind of free flowing apart from an attachment down into the sacrum at the bottom of the column and then a few powerful attachments in the cranium the whole dura ideally is free to move so let's imagine a, a couple of clients coming to see you so maybe one client comes who's just very healthy and they've either had very little trauma to the body or they've had trauma that they've resolved and uh, they get on the table you put your hands maybe down at the bottom of the vertebral column uh, under the sacrum and listen in and for sure one of the things that will come to you uh, come into your perception will be the dura mater and it will feel quite typically like a tube uh, with a balloon at the top of it and if somebody's really healthy they'll show you the whole continuity of this membrane structure because it's in communication with itself it has a 
balanced relational field, let's say. And then off the body goes into all kinds of reorganizational processes. Or another client comes to see you and then the history, the history of this body is very different. Perhaps there's been a whole series of difficult experiences ranging from you know, physical trauma to the body right through to emotional distress of some kind or other. Um, and all of that's still bound up in the body in some way. So they get on the table. And from the outside, it looks exactly the same as the last session. You go to the sacrum, put your hand on the sacrum and just kind of wait. But it's a very different revealing of structures this time. So typically, the more trauma affects that are held in the body, the less the body is able to convey a sort of continuity of uh, structure. And let's say that's just what happens in the session. So you notice that things around the lumbar sacral area are quite tight. The dura is not moving so easily. And then maybe the midsection around the thoracics is much freer. But then you notice that everything from the neck upwards is just actually not even there. So the cranial dura and whatever's going on in the neck is not even showing itself. So it feels like there's no upper body, actually. And uh, that's quite typical. So what do you do? Uh, well, you sit back and wait. You open up to the health of the body. You're offering this holistic touch and all those, all that list of relational attributes. And sure enough, given the chance, the body will respond. Maybe not in the way you think it will. So maybe initially it doesn't even do anything with the dura. The reorganization is in some of the parts of the body. Uh, maybe it's in the legs. That's quite typical. Maybe legs need to shift and arms in coming out of some kind of fight or flight response that's kind of not worked its way through the body or typically as well something around breathing and the chest the diaphragm that seems to go off quite a lot in the body and maybe the client goes through a process of some emotional uh, letting go or uh, a kind of distress coming out of the body uh, in terms of uh, reorganization of fascias and um, sort of nervous system discharges. And then suddenly the client takes a big breath and sort of deepens their breath. And it, it's like, oh, it's like they've been holding their breath all along. And suddenly the body goes quiet and still. That is a very typical series of events in, in therapy. And you're sitting there watching and listening and being with the unfolding reorganization of the body. And then you're waiting. And very typically, the body comes out of a sort of pause or a settled state or a stillness and then starts to address another set of structures. Maybe this time it's something to do with the dura. And then the dura and the vertebral column start to shift and then you're into a second round of uh, adjustments. That's, that's the nature of the therapy. So relational fields unfold and there's an idea of a, a sort of narrow relational field, a kind of wider and a, a wide relational field, and within all those different relational fields, uh, different parts of your system come through and heal. So here's what happens in the narrow relational field. So basically, this is a relational field that has a conversation between all the different pieces of your body. So it's it, it's commonly a very physiological expression that's coming to you. So this picture is showing muscles and 
nerve pathways, so and really any layer of the system. And this 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 narrow field seems to be where the body's structure wants to change and shift and reorganize. So you would talk about adjustments, I guess, that are kind of being uh, generated by themselves. So maybe you're noticing something around a, a joint or fascial sheets are starting to shift and change or maybe um, organs or muscles and so on. So that's a very typical expression in the narrow field. But then we notice this occurs. So the body seems to kind of melt and dissolve and the structure goes into a more morphic state and sometimes quickly sometimes more slowly it sort of disappears into the body as a unit and the body is a fluid membranous unit so that's quite a different relational field it's like you've gone from a conversation between several thousand pieces of structure to a conversation with a whole body fluid shape and uh, what we notice when this occurs is there's more potency um, the body is more amorphic uh, so it can more readily change it's not like hard structure in relationship to each other it's more a continuity of fluid and we notice too that it's not such specific reorganizations that you would have in the narrow field it's more of a whole body reorganization so you might notice some kind of curling or side bending movement throughout say the left side of the body or something to do with the shoulder into the chest and neck so that kind of thing plus um, there's a kind of slowing down of this deep rhythm of life which is recognized within the uh, craniosacral uh, field of primary respiration so we notice things start to slow down there's a kind of a slower rhythm in the body that tends to be more of an access to stillness um, and then this can occur so the body goes into what we call a wide uh, relational field where I think it's really trying to connect with almost the ecosystem the body's trying to find its relationship to other things in the space around it and then even into a wider relationship to nature and other living things and this seems to be more like a uh, reintegration or, 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 or a coming back to some deep original relationship so this can feel quite remarkable and uh, again we notice there's a shift in things it kind of goes from more of a fluid state to more 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 like a air-like state perhaps and uh, things slow down again uh, even more stillness and, and, and these subtle rhythms are getting much much slower this is the current biodynamic paradigm certainly within the body intelligence courses which is trying to show this notion of behind all movement there is a living stillness we call it dynamic stillness kind of doesn't make too much sense movement and stillness but it's like the kind of hum of life that's in the background and then out of that comes expressions of health we 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 call these movements the breath of life and uh, the kind of slow rhythmic movement that comes through in that wide perceptual field we call the long tide in that fluid body state we call the mid tide and then in the narrow field we call the cranial rhythmic impulse so we notice these things going on within the physiology of the body and that's a way 
of relating to the deep health that is within and behind the physiology. So tissues resonate with each other in all kinds of remarkable ways and the body wants to reorganize itself by itself and it just needs the right container to do that so I would say the container is the relational field that is being established by the practitioner's contact with the client so these are quite interesting images to just show another concept that runs within the work so this idea of balanced tension and I think balanced tension is health so in health bodies want to be in balanced tension they might not be they might be in hypertension or hypotension because of whatever's happened to their body but this is a nice balanced picture this one not so so something's gone on there's a distortion in the blue line here so I think this shows how things go in the body it's not just local but it's also global so that distortion there has been or maybe the, the, the momentum of whatever's brought that about has been absorbed and taken up by the whole body including the neck and the shoulder girdle so you can come along and touch and just because you've got knowing hands that are very able to feel these tensile energies in the body you, you, you notice how torsioned this body is and, 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 and uh, you notice the details of that so that's quite typical and um, we say most structures in the body are longitudinal because we're you know very axial uh, but also those these cross structures so we get very interested in so-called transverse diaphragms of which I think there's maybe a, upwards of 10 in the body and this picture is showing the you know sort of column and the pelvic floor the respiratory diaphragm kind of the shoulder girdle the thoracic inlet and the cranial base and so on so what typically occurs is there's a re resonance between these different structures so if your breathing gets tight it's very difficult to avoid your pelvic floor getting tight it just seems to be a consequence in time of tension held within one of these structures or you got a tight jaw and the same thing it just starts to clatter down the body and other structures other transverse diaphragms come out in sympathy almost and during sessions um, th there's a remarkable event that occurs where you might notice as the practitioner something trying to shift in the respiratory diaphragm and then it kind of pauses partway through that reorganization because you've got this holistic touch you're able to notice something beginning to shift in the pelvic floor and, and then that releases and then suddenly the respiratory diaphragm can continue with a deeper reorganization then the breath is back in a much fuller capacity so that's very much something that happens in every session and there's a concept of literally resonance through shape so on the left here we're looking at the sphenoid which is a bone uh, as part of the cranial base of the skull and then on the right it's uh, a picture of the pelvis so they do look quite similar uh, even though one's much smaller but I don't know how many times I've noticed this but somebody's sphenoid makes a, a shift or it sort of derotates or something or expands on the right and some letting go and then suddenly something very similar occurs in the pelvis and so the kind of intricacy that goes on between different structures in the body is very much uh, acknowledged this is too so very couple of phrases here that come up lots 
fluid midline. So this idea of the very center of your body, the epicenter of the body, there is a fluid midline that uh, readily emerges in sessions. And when it does, it's often a, quite a you know critical point. And after that, really the body starts to find a whole new level of health. An embryological blueprint, so this idea that uh, at the back of physiology is a kind of embryonic mm, template almost that, 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 that's still there in the body. Anyway, let's have a look at a few images just to illustrate all of this. So here's a picture of the uh, brain with the cord. And uh, I don't know how much neuroanatomy you know, but actually probably about a quarter, 20% of the brain uh, is fluid spaces. Uh, they're called ventricles. So the, the lateral ventricles are very big. And then there's a third and fourth ventricle and all these intriguing canals. So part of how the brain generates a lightness is it's getting buoyed up from within it um, through these fluid spaces and around it through another fluid space. So we notice in sessions that uh, the potency in these fluid spaces is quite remarkable. It can be typically much more profound than in any other part of the body. Um, or it can go through a process of what we call potentization, where it's like this um, energizing or vitalizing of these spaces occurs. And so, there's a mystery in that for sure, but something within all that seems to affect the central nervous system in a really positive and optimal way. Uh, here's an image just going back to embryonic development and early days from conception through to third and fourth week and at the fourth week the neural tube is formed. So this picture is just trying to show what happens in the you know following month after the neural tube is formed. You know the, the embryo starts to really emerge uh, with limbs and face and organs but Actually, what it's showing as well is the what's happening to the neural tube. It's getting buried actually uh, within the form. So it's the the body we have now starts off as a very simple neural tube, and there's a generation of cell division out from the neural tube that starts to initially form the early vesicles of the brain, and then out from that forms the structures on the outside, so the vertebral column, the cranium, and the organs and the limbs and so on. Uh, but meanwhile, the neural tube is still there. It's um, It's got reshaped, as you can see on the right there, as the brain gets more complex. And we can see from this slide that that's occurring even more profoundly now as the embryo comes into the latter part of its growth uh, with the cerebrum growing on top of the neural tube all these different parts of the brain emerging from it you could say uh, and different glands too in you could say the whole body emerges from the neural tube so the neural tube is actually ground zero in terms of the form, but actually it's still there. It's buried deep within the central nervous system, but it's still a fluid space. It started off as a amniotic fluid. It's now a cerebrospinal fluid, but actually it's got quite a lot in common with amniotic fluid. So the very center of our body isn't structure. It's actually a fluid space. It, it has no structure. And so in um, the biodynamic sessions, this is something that typically emerges and shows itself, and we call it the fluid midline. And when it kind of really deepens into it, the whole body starts to reorganize and find a new balance back 
to its original center. And then there's this powerful event that occurs around day 23, 24, where the neural tube goes into this massive C curve. So we're looking at that here. And at the bottom there, you can see a very typical embryo uh, image. And above it, really just this tube going into a big curl, really. Uh, so it's unfolding. Here's another picture of it. So here's the neural tube zipping up. So at this point, it's very early neurons, really. It's kind of ectodermal cells. So we're looking at what will become the brain and the cord with no surround. There's no muscles or bones around it as yet. And then it seals itself up. So you've got this sealed container of fluid within this midline that then starts to develop into a whole body movement. Uh, here's a cross section showing the same thing. This is a great picture from Larson's Embryology, which I really recommend. And again, you're seeing the tube now with the front and the back space of the sort of embryonic uh, sacs, the amniotic and the yolk, and then how the big curling movement generates the beginning of a 3D body. And you can see the heart's beginning to come into place there, the gut. But it's all very hollow at this point. But the big thing is the neural tube. It's surrounding everything. And uh, so the, so embryologically there is an enfoldment and then there's an unfolding. That's what seems to happen. So here's, here's an interesting video that was taken by some researchers, uh, I think at Johns Hopkins University a few years back showing the growth of the embryo through to the newborn. And it's remarkable. You can see how the body is forming through a series of curling movements. Curling, uncurling, flexing, extending particularly in the brain itself, but throughout the whole body. So, uh, if you, well, as a, a craniosacral therapist, if you put somebody on a table and lie them on their side and put a hand at the back of their head and a hand at the back of the pelvis and open up to a relationship with the central nervous system you can feel this movement and it literally feels like that it feels like there's a kind of subtle curling and a subtle uncurling and that is an expression of health within this therapy and maybe it's not there initially but over a number of sessions these deep primal movements start to return and sure enough health comes through for the client and their condition improves the symptom picture changes and you know the body's back in action so what is BCST it's very much about listening to health and being with health even in terrible pathologies where people's systems are being ravaged by some disease process, there is huge health in the cell, in the wholeness of the body, in the fluids, so really you become a health expert. Um, being highly attuned to the body means you need to be in your felt sense awareness, so it's a journey into a finessing of awareness in your body, so dropping into your own relational field. That seems to be a really important part of the work, and that seems to enable another body to open up into felt sense. You touch somebody, you're still, you're 
non-invasive, you're giving that body a safe space and you're listening to health. There's an automatic trauma resolution process. You don't need to ask it to emerge. It just goes into it. The body wants to find homeostasis. Uh, so that's what we find. It is a very powerful therapeutic practice and it uh, seems to be getting better and better with more people coming in and learning the therapy. There's some remarkable process of evolution of the work where uh, the next set of students studying the work just seem to pick it up more powerfully and uh, deepen into some new aspect of the work. It's all it's so about the autonomic balance and homeostasis. So really recognizing what state the autonomic nervous system is in and watching as it starts to free itself up. And yeah, joy and bliss, that's our inheritance. And that's something that starts to come into the body and uh, that's a great thing to see and then people's systems perhaps relearn how to rest and uh, be still and calm and, and, and they start to carry that around with them and, and, and the physiology loves it couldn't be better really okay so I thought we'd just um, I'd just talk you through a, a an exercise here which is one of the many exercises we run in the course and uh, quite an important one about letting go of tension in your hands uh, so to touch in a neutral way you need to be relaxed really uh, and to let go of uh, not just conscious tensions but the unconscious uh, so I wonder if you can just put things down and sit and I'll talk for probably about five minutes and, and then I just want you to notice uh, sensations in your body and what happens as, as a result of setting this up. Great, uh, so let's get interested in the back of the hands and I just want you to place them on your thighs. So the palms are looking up, the fingers are spread slightly and then I just want you to really let the your hands go heavy into your legs. And let's go through each digit one at a time. So I want you to let go of tension in your thumbs and just really let the weight of the thumbs come through. And that big muscle, the bottom of the thumb, can often be quite tight. So let's see if we can just ask it to ease off and then let that carry on of its own accord and then I want you to do the same for the index finger and then the same for the middle finger and just let them carry on finding their weight and letting go and then the same for the ring finger and not just the finger but the extension of the finger into the palms so the whole kind of metacarpal expression and then lastly the small finger and, and just, just noticing how consciously letting go of all your fingers feels not just in your hands but elsewhere in the body and then let your palms spread so that's just really letting go of those small muscles that uh, abound in the center of the hand and maybe one hand feels a bit tighter than the other that won't be unusual and the hands keep going don't they into the carpals and the wrists so Let's kind of soften around the wrist. We can hold crazy amounts of tension there. And then all these long muscles, flexor muscles and flexor tendons 
coming along the forearm, I want us to consciously let go there as well. They can be extremely strong and tight. So we're just going to work through from the hands into the elbows now. And let's not leave it there, let's keep going. Let's come up the arms and letting go of the biceps right into the shoulder and the rotator cuff, the deltoids. Just kind of letting both arms drop from the shoulder girdle. That's quite a nice thing to do. And we're going to keep going up the segment because the hand segment comes right up into the neck. And so letting go of the trapezius down, which attaches obviously into the cranial base, into the neck, and fans out into the scapula and into the clavicle. And now consciously letting your jaw drop. And let your, to uh, your uh, tongue follow suit as well, just kind of soften the tongue. And now same with the eyes. Let's go right up to the eyes and kind of come into a peripheral vision. If your eyes are open or if they're closed, just let them be soft and relaxed. Great, and just let that be of itself. And now I want you to get interested in the sides of your body. So side of your head, uh, the flank, the side of the torso, down the outside of the leg, for both the left and the right side of the body. And I want you to use the sides of your body to kind of open up to the space left and right. So you're interested in what's going on left and right of your body. So that produces quite an interesting lateral space. Let's do a similar thing for front and back. So coming into felt sense awareness of your face and the chest and belly front of your legs, space in front of you. Letting all of that relax. And let's do the same at the back of the head, uh, the back of the chest, back of the pelvis, back of your legs, down to your heels. Let's open up to the space behind. Good, and let's be interested in the back of the body and the front of the body at the same time, and then let's come back to the left and the right. And I want you to let your body go into the spaces. Let it be supported by the spaces around you. And now just let your mind settle and go completely neutral. Let go of any intention. And I'm just going to be quiet for a minute or so so you can be in sensation.
Okay, and just letting that go, let your body come back into movement. So that was an exercise that we use on the course and many others to help you establish a relational field so that your touch can be of the right quality. So let's just move on to a few more things. Here's a useful book written by me and Steve Haynes. That's one of the course books and is very consistent with the body intelligence approach. And uh, so that could be a very useful insight into the biodynamic approach to craniosacral therapy and is available, I think, through Amazon and so on. Um, so uh, that could be just some further study for you to get to know the therapy a bit more. And this is quite useful as well. So a book I wrote uh, around body intelligence meditation that really is about just what we did. You know, many different kinds of awareness exercises that allow you to drop into felt sense awareness. Again, it's available uh, through Amazon and so on. And there's a website around that that could be quite useful and interesting. Body Intelligence Training runs courses, I think, in about 50 locations now worldwide and probably about 18 to 20 countries. So uh, it's available probably close to you somewhere. And uh, it's settled into uh, a particular format um, that uh, we can talk about. So about the course... It's uh, basically five-day seminars, which run from Wednesday to Sunday over about 20 to 22 months. So there's 10 seminars, and uh, it's part-time. But it's also, you know, quite an intense course. Each seminar is kind of looks at things in quite a deep way, and there's, it's meant to be, you know, kind of deep exploration of the nature of the work but also your own system and part of the process of training is to develop skills of listening but also to resolve uh, things that might be residing in your own system. Uh, so we say uh, get a treatment from a professional therapist so you can kind of feel how it is and then come along to an intro talk or uh, talk to a local contact uh, about the work. And then we organise the course so you can come along to Seminar 1 the first five days and get a really deep impression of the work and a, a powerful first-hand experience of it. And if it fits for you, then you sign up for the whole training. So I, I think we want to be sure that it is a fit for you and that it's something that you want to take on and, uh, because it's, uh, it's, it is an undertaking for sure. Uh, the seminar experience is, well, a bit like this. It's somebody, a senior tutor, talking, probably going through some presentation, some aspect of the work, and then there's perhaps an experiential exercise, and then there's some demonstration of a hands-on session and then the group pairs up and there's a sort of practicing of that with students and then the tutors move around the tables often join in and touch in with you in the very ways and and and, and perhaps suggest things that can improve the contact uh, and then at the end of that uh, we all come together and discuss things if there's something to discuss and then that's it really go on to the next piece and, and, and that's how each day unfolds it's a continuous assessment process so that it's not an exam based thing it's us keeping tabs with you part of the uh, process of learning is not just tutors coming to the table and helping you out, but also you putting your hands on tutors as a student. Um, again, not as a test, but 
in order to get valid, hopefully useful feedback so you can really change some aspects of your contact. And that seems to really speed the learning up in a, in a very useful way. There's home study, uh, for sure, the course is an academic, it's m more about touching people, touching practice clients. So we say in the first year of the course, find people who are reasonably healthy so you can touch them and experience, you know, easy, uh, natural reorganizational processes uh, rather than having to deal with quite a lot of trauma. And then in the second part of the course, we say, well, you're more experienced now in your contacts and so you understand the nature of trauma and its expression so it's fine to take people's people on who, who are running perhaps more pathology or more obvious trauma states um, so that's how we play um, the hands-on sessions so you need to touch a couple of people a week and there's a few written assignments not too long and then looking at anatomy perhaps or we, we might ask you to think about something and write about it some aspect of the work and you've also got a tutor you can reach out to between seminars so it tends to be five days and then there's a two month gap and then another five days so you go away for quite a bit of time and kind of practice the work and look into it in more depth the course is accredited by a number of different private cranial biodynamic cranial associations worldwide. There's a list on the website and they hold us to a set of standards and uh, the college is part of the international biodynamic affiliation, which is a group of similarly minded colleges that have come together and set out standards around biodynamic work and education and really it's very exciting i think being in practice i mean more and more people are getting to know about the therapy and the great thing about it is it works uh, really well and people make very profound shifts and often uh, with very strong pathologies things are starting to shift and change with all kinds of different conditions so uh, definitely you can go into practice. It would be the world of private practice. <coughs> but I think in time, you could definitely generate uh, a powerful practice and uh, earn a living from it and also be in this remarkable position of touching and listening to life in all its glory in somebody's system. So a really neat job to have. Okay, thanks for listening.